Today's first reading is taken from the closing chapter of the book of Exodus. It describes the setting up by Moses of the tabernacle and the tent of meeting and the installing in the tabernacle of the ark in which the tablets of the covenant are to be kept. The fact that 12 chapters of Exodus are dedicated to instructions about and then to an account of the building of the tent and its furnishings underlines just how important they were in the life of early Israel. The tabernacle was understood as a very special place where in a unique way God dwelled in the midst of his people. It was a place of encounter between him and them and especially between him and Moses. Because the tabernacle and everything in it were thought to participate in and reflect the holiness of God, their construction had to involve the finest materials and the highest quality of workmanship. Today's reading recounts the end of that process. Moses sets up the tent and the tabernacle and installs in them the ark, the altars of sacrifice and of incense, the table of the bread of presence, and the lampstand or menorah. The closing paragraph of the reading contains the final verses of the book. In them we are told that the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The cloud and the pillar of fire have been the symbols of God's presence to the people since their escape from Egypt. They went before them on their journey to Sinai and remained with them at the foot of the mountain. The Lord now promises that they will accompany the Israelites as they set out from Sinai for the land promised to their ancestors. When the cloud rests on the tabernacle, they will rest. When it moves, they will move. At night a column of fire will appear in the cloud, making it visible before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. The story of Exodus begins the long history of the relationship between Israel and its God, a history that continues today and in which Christians participate through the covenant extended to them in Jesus. Exodus not only begins the story, it defines much that is at its heart. The central figure in it is God himself. He hears the cry of the oppressed and intervenes on their behalf. Having liberated Israel from Egypt, God brings them to Sinai where through Moses he seals a covenant with them. He commits himself to be their God and invites them to be his people. It will be their responsibility to keep the commandments and to live in ways that reflect their vocation to be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. The tabernacle and the glory that fills it give visible form to God's continuing presence in the midst of his people. As important as the tent and tabernacle are for Israel in the wilderness, they also point forward to and find their fulfillment in the temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. Just as a tent, which can be easily set up and taken down, fits the condition of a semi-nomadic people, so the imposing and solid structure of the Jerusalem temple gives a focus to a nation settled in its own land with its own distinctive religious, political, and cultural life. For centuries, the temple, like the tent, functioned for Israel as a center for worship and a focus of devotion. Their people offered sacrifices and gathered to celebrate the major festivals of the liturgical year. Their God continued to be present to his people. Today's responsorial psalm is one of several psalms that reflect the kind of deeply felt temple piety that was so central a component of Israel's religious life. 
my soul longs. Indeed, it faints for the courts of the Lord, the psalmist says. Happy are those who live in your house, O Lord, ever singing your praise. A day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. The tradition of the tabernacle and of the temple entered a new phrase with the coming of Jesus. John's Gospel emphasizes that in him the very word or wisdom of God has become flesh, has set up his tent in our midst. In him the glory of God is revealed in a human face and in human gestures. In his account of the cleansing of the temple, John goes further than the other evangelists. They emphasize its prophetic nature. Jesus drives out the money changers and those involved in the selling of animals because, as he puts it, they have made what was supposed to be a house of prayer into a den of robbers. John sees in the event a revelation by Jesus that in some way he is replacing the temple. He is now the one in whom God dwells in a new and distinctive way. His life and death constitute the perfect sacrifice. Paul and other New Testament writers pick up these ideas and extend them to embrace the church. Those who believe in Jesus share in his life. Through faith and baptism, we become living stones that are being built up into a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. For Catholics, the word tabernacle evokes the place in the church in which the Eucharistic bread is kept. There it becomes a focus for prayer and worship. In the Eucharist, Christ, who himself is the presence of God in human form, dwells sacramentally among us. The church building that houses the tabernacle is like the tent of meeting. Here we gather to encounter God, to listen to his word, to offer him with and in Christ perfect worship and praise. Here we are reminded that God is with us, and like the cloud and the pillar of fire, he goes before us on our journey into the future. The God whose presence we recognize and celebrate in Jesus is the God of Exodus and Sinai, the God of liberation and salvation, the God who with Abraham and then in a new way with Moses entered into a relationship with one people, a relationship that had and has implications for all peoples. Although in a way that is different from the experience of our Jewish sisters and brothers, we too are part of that history. We too rejoice in God's presence in our midst and with them look forward to the final and definitive fulfillment of God's saving plan for the whole of humanity. Let us now in faith and trust present before God our needs. For all of us that are sharing in this Eucharist will deepen our sense of God's presence in the midst of our lives, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For victims of violence and hunger throughout the world, that those who can will reach out to them in their need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the intentions of our donors and of those who have called and written in asking for our prayers, let us pray to the Lord. That the Pope's recent encyclical will bring insight and encouragement to people involved in the pursuit of peace and justice. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord in your for those who have died recently, especially those for whom no one is praying, let us pray to the Lord. Lord in your Gracious God, we ask you to hear and grant these prayers as well as the more personal ones that each one of us has in his or her own heart. All this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. 